Ball on the 22. Got to get to the 11-yard line. Mendoza pressure gets hit as he throws into the end zone. Touchdown to Brady! This is Jonathan Brady catching a game-winning pass from Fernando Mendoza, beating Stanford in one of college football's fiercest rivalries. It looks simple. A clean throw, a perfect catch. But what if I told you there's a lot more happening here than meets the eye? You can break down the throw by first calculating the range. Mendoza releases the ball around the 32-yard line, converting to roughly 29 meters. We find out that the ball was in the air for around 101 frames at a 60 FPS frame rate. We then find the horizontal velocity, which comes out to around 17.38 meters per second. We can now turn our attention to vertical motion. The ball's vertical velocity drops over time due to gravity. At the peak, vertical velocity is zero. We use that midpoint to give us the initial vertical speed, which is about 8.25 meters per second. So now we have both components of our velocity vector. Putting both of these together, we get the full initial velocity vector. To find the total speed, we take the magnitude of this very same vector using the Pythagorean theorem. The result is about 19.31 meters per second. To calculate the launch angle, we take the inverse hand of the velocities. So far, we've calculated how far the ball has traveled horizontally, but the real path that follows through the air is longer because the ball curves. To calculate that, we use the arc length formula, integrating total velocity over time. Since vertical velocity changes as the ball rises and falls, we define it as this equation. By plugging in all of our numbers, we see the arc length to be approximately 31.56 meters. Now we can visualize the actual path the football followed. The red dot on the yellow arc represents the curved flight of the ball, what we just calculated as the arc length. Rather than going straight across, the ball follows a smooth trajectory. We can also express the ball's height over time using this position equation. Taking its derivative, we get the vertical velocity function that decreases steadily. Now we bring this math to life by graphing the ball's vertical position over time. At each moment, the slope of the curve tells us how fast the ball is moving vertically. At the top of the arc, we see that the instantaneous slope is equal to zero, showing that there is no vertical velocity at the top. We can now graph vertical velocity over time and interpret displacement as the area under its curve. The blue triangle that's shown in this graph represents the upward part of its motion. Its area gives us the maximum vertical displacement as the football is traveling. Once the ball hits its peak, it starts to fall down further. That area is shown in red in the graph. If we include this red triangle in our calculations, the total displacement becomes zero, which makes sense since the ball ends up at about the same height it started at. Next, we can define the radial speed, how fast the ball is moving along the direct line from quarterback to receiver. It starts with total distance over time. Using the chain rule, we take the derivative of this square root. This simplifies to a clean formula. Radial speed will equal the weighted average of the motion in both the x and y directions. Now let's actually calculate the speed from the quarterback to the ball over our time. We already know that Mendoza threw with a speed of about 19.31 meters per second at a 25.4 degree angle. We break this up into its components and plug in expressions for position and velocity. This gives us the full equation for how the distance between the quarterback and ball changes every second. But velocity isn't the whole story. What really matters to the receiver is how quickly that velocity is changing. This is where we take the derivative again. When this value becomes negative, it means that the ball is accelerating towards them. That's when their brain tells them to catch the ball. So calculus doesn't just model the motion, it models the moment of human reaction. The equation of d squared s over dt squared tells us the change in how fast the ball is speeding towards you. Lower values mean smoother, more catchable passes. Like plugging in the values for our example, we can find out where exactly the pass is most catchable. When we graph out our equation, we find a specific point where the values are the smoothest, making it the easiest to catch the ball at this time. Mendoza's throw traveled at a horizontal speed of 17 meters per second, launched at a 25.4 degree angle with a total initial speed of 19.31 meters per second. Using calculus, we determined that the ball reached a peak vertical displacement of about 3.47 meters. 
by using the equations we derived in the arc length formula, we can determine that Mendoza's Pass covered over 31.5 meters in the air. We also took a look at the dy by dt equation, which told us that at the top of the trajectory, the ball had no vertical velocity, and all the way at the end, it had its maximum vertical velocity of around 8.25 meters per second. We also saw that integrating the vertical velocity function gave us the total vertical displacement, which came out to about 3.47 meters. We then found the equation that models the rate the ball approached the receiver at. We found that the second derivative turning negative meant that the ball is accelerating towards them, and that's the moment that they instinctively react at. We then graphed the radial acceleration magnitude versus time. We found that the moment that has the smoothest acceleration can also be seen through this graph. By graphing out this equation, we find out that wherever there's a minimum in this graph of d squared s over dt squared, that's where the ball is most catchable.